The Religious Freedom Restoration Act is now law in Indiana after the governor signed the bill yesterday. The measure prohibits the government from infringing on a person's religious practice unless it has a compelling reason to do so. The law, also known as RIFRA, has sparked fierce debate this session. Supporters and opponents of the measure rallied at the State House this month to express their views. Advocates say it will protect their religious liberties, allowing a caterer to refuse to serve at an abortion provider luncheon, for example. Those against the law say it legalizes discrimination, especially against people in the, G in the LGBT community. The Indiana Chamber of Commerce has been a staunch opponent of RIFRA, saying it will keep companies from doing business in the state. And in fact, this week, organizers of the gaming convention Gen Con said they would move out of Indianapolis if the governor signed the bill. And the Indianapolis-based based NCAA said it was very concerned about the impact the law could have on its student athletes. But the governor did sign the bill, and RIFRA is set to take effect July 1st. So what impact will RIFRA actually have? To help us answer that question, we are joined by two IU law professors. Dan Kunkel has testified in favor of RIFRA, and Rob Katz testified against it. Thank you both for joining us. Good Dan, let's start with you. The law requires the government to have that term compelling interest before it infringes on someone's religious beliefs. What does that mean? Good question. I mean, the first point I would make is, is that if this, if this law, in fact, meant what some of the critics claim it meant, I would not have supported it. The, the criticism really, to my judgment, in my judgment, is really over the top in exaggerating the effect of this law. The government would, in fact, have a compelling interest justifying an intrusion on religious freedom in the most obvious cases if, self, if, if health or safety were at issue, for example, child care requirements of safety, uh, or suppose a claim uh, involving some kind of an abuse of a child or other injury to a person, clearly the government could trump a religious freedom objection. Likewise, uh, to my mind, in the context of the discrimination claims, so far in the 30 states that have a similar approach, as well as at the federal level, there has been no case anywhere that has in fact found a successful religious objection claim in the face of an anti-discrimination law. But uh, Rob, now you say, you argue RIFRA is unnecessary. That, why is that? It's unnecessary because the existing Indiana Constitution has a free exercise provision that's very strong um, that the Indiana Supreme Court has interpreted our free exercise provision in a way that is uh, very respectful and uh, demanding of the government before it's going to burden religious exercise. And we have a very receptive state legislature that when people have uh, feel that they are burdened in their free exercise, they can go to the legislature and ask for an accommodation. For example, there are people who have religious objections to their children being vaccinated. So there was a group, they went to the state legislature, they asked for an accommodation, and they received an exemption from the law. So the existing system we have in place for accommodating people who feel burdened was entirely sufficient, which makes the law um, unnecessary but nonetheless disturbing because um, the, uh, it makes a statement that religious freedom is the preeminent freedom and, uh, and it's, it suggests that it uh, potentially trumps other concerns, legitimate concerns, such as freedom from discrimination. And this was illustrated very clearly at the, at the hearing in the Judiciary Committee in the House when uh, uh, test, people testifying, including myself, expressly asked the legislature, you say this is about protecting religious freedom. Well, if we take you at your word, then why not go ahead and state in the statute this law does not uh, trump freedom from uh, discrimination? If why I not could, declare? Yeah, if I, if I could just jump in a little bit on that. The first <coughs> part of, of what Professor Katz said I'm entirely sympathetic with, even though I disagree with, which is you can argue legitimately about whether this law is or is not needed. Do we have sufficient protection under the Indiana Constitution? The claims that I reject are some of the media, uh, not, this, not this great show, but some of the social media in particular that's making exaggerated claims about license to discriminate and, and the like. And on whether there should be an explicit exception for civil rights claims, that too is a legitimate argument. The particular amendments that were proposed in the Indiana legislature 
were, in my, to my mind, not crafted with sufficient clarity. The devil is in the details. The state of Texas does have an exception for civil rights claims in its RFRA provision that was very carefully crafted, dealing with religious entities differently than, non, than uh, corporations, for example, or individuals. That would be a different matter than the, than the proposals that were actually suggested. Is it still too late to make any changes or amendments? Absolutely not. I think now, it, given the, uh, the wake of, uh, of the statute's enactment and the concerns that clearly uh, were not adequately addressed about uh, insufficient protection for, uh, from discrimination, I think now would be a perfect moment for the state legislature to amend RIFRA to say to, that Professor Conkle and I and other colleagues could try to, and legislators, of course, could try to hammer out language that does uh, reflect more and respect and for as a, and as a first step, and, and as a first step, I think Professor Katz and I might agree, Indiana has no statewide prohibition on sexual orientation discrimination. Utah recently adopted such a provision, albeit with substantial protection for religious freedom as well. That's where, in my judgment, the energy should currently reside. Let's get statewide protection against sexual orientation discrimination, and then if we need to modify the RFRA, we could deal with that in that context. But at the moment, most folks in Indiana, unless you live in Bloomington, Indiana, South Bend, a few other cities, there's no protection against sexual orientation discrimination, regardless of whether the business is religiously motivated or not. So just in conclusion, we have like 10 seconds, though, really briefly, what's going to be this average impact July 1st to Indiana Hoosiers? Well, I think, I think it's very hard to say. I mean, it may be very minimal. In, in the states that have this approach, 30 states, in, if, if you count state constitutional law, there is some RIFRA litigation, but not a whole lot. We may or may not have it. This law is highly publicized. Maybe that'll generate claims. Maybe it won't. Well, I think typically when you pass a legislation, it's supposed to be a solution to a problem. And given that, in my view, there was no problem to which this was a solution, I think mostly what will happen is we'll have new problems that weren't anticipated, uh, and um, it's, it's a source of concern. I think we can all agree to stay tuned.